Hello everyone and welcome to today's Cultivating Success Sustainable Small Farms Education webinar. Today's topic is backyard poultry production. The Cultivating Success program is a 20-year partnership of the University of Idaho Extension, the Small Acreage Farming Nonprofit Rural Roots, and the Washington State University Food Systems Program. We have special support for this program from the Western SARE program, which is a USDA research and education program focused on sustainable agriculture. Today's presenter is Kate Painter. Kate is an extension educator in agriculture with University of Idaho Extension. She's located in Boundary County, which is Bonners Ferry, our most northern county. I am Colette D. Phelps. I'll be your facilitator today. I'm an area educator in community food systems, and I am located in Moscow on the University of Idaho campus. So a few webinar tips as we get started. We are all struggling a little bit with bandwidth at this time where we're social distancing and many of us are working from home. If at any time you have problems with your sound, you can type into the chat for technical assistance. You can also switch to the telephone. If you switch to the telephone, there was a call in number in your welcome email and you can mute your computer sound when you're using the phone to avoid feedback. You can type questions in for Kate into the Q&A box anytime during the presentation. She has several opportunities where we'll stop and she'll answer those questions. I did send the handouts with today's slide to you via email. Those handouts came in two formats, one as a full page slide for easier viewing and the second handout set is four slides per page in the case you would like to print them. With that, I'm going to go ahead and turn over the presentation to Kate. Kate, thanks for presenting today, and I'm really excited to learn a lot more about backyard poultry production. Good morning, everyone. I love to talk about this topic. So let me get my screen back up to where it should be. Sorry, okay, so um, my name is Kate Painter and I, I, I love to raise poultry. I've done lots of experiments. Um, this is gonna be focused more on beginners, backyard poultry production, not the large scale, scale pastured poultry that you see here, but just a warning, uh, poultry is called the, what do they call that? Um, it's the gateway drug to farming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for shouting that out, Colette. Once you start, it's hard to stop sometimes, especially if you get um, interested in incubating your own eggs like I did. It's so much fun to watch those little eggs start to rock and roll and the little chicks to hatch out. And um, anyway, it is a lot of fun and it's exciting to, to hear that so many people are interested in uh, um, raising chickens for their own eggs in their backyard. It's a great way to have um, some, definitely to have some food security in your own household. It's a great uh, lesson in farming and biology and the kids love it. And uh, it fits well into most backyards and there's a lot of urban areas that do allow it. I do um, want to recommend that it, like any kind of raising livestock, there's a lot that goes into raising chickens for your own egg production. I have known so many people that have lost their poultry due to predators. I think that's one of the, the hardest things to uh, protect your chickens because there's lots of critters that you don't really know are around and aren't normally a problem, but everybody loves chickens. Um, uh, there's a lot of reasons to raise backyard chickens they produce those wonderful eggs. They're bright orange, they're full of vitamin A, and you're creating your, you're growing your own high quality protein in your own backyard. I also love it because I feed them my food scraps and leftovers. Um, they love weeds. They love all kinds of things, especially green stuff this time of year. And in turn, they generate rich manure for your garden. It's pretty rich, and so it does need to be composted um, well composted before you put it 
in your garden. And they are little tractors. They will till up your garden if you fence them into your garden, which means you also need to fence them out of your garden. Otherwise, they will till up what you've just planted. So there, I, I just feel very strongly that there's no point if your chickens are out and about to put in a garden because they will ruin it. You've got to have a fence. Um, but they are very, very good at eating bugs and those plants. And it's really fun to put them in your garden when you're, when you're done with it at the end of the season. So look at these beautiful eggs. The deep orange egg on the right is your free range grass pastured egg or hen that's outside and has a happy, stress, less stressful life. And they have a lot better nutrition for you. It's hard to generalize when I try to get um, a typical answer. It said, well, it just really depends. Um, you'd have, you have to have very specific assumptions. But in general, your free range grass pastured eggs tend to have one third less cholesterol, one quarter less saturated fat, two thirds more vitamin A, three times as much vitamin E, seven times more beta, beta carotene, which is a good form of vitamin A, I'm saying that right, I believe that's that's correct. And um, anyway, it's a form of vitamin A. I'm not a nutritionist, um, and it has two times as much omega three fatty acids, which is the 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 oils that we tend to be low in. So um, the one of the other determining factors is what kind of feed that chicken gets. Well, an industrially raised chicken is probably eating as cheap as they can and still get production kind of feed. And when we buy our Purina or whatever, our, our well-formulated Laina type um, feed, it's better quality typically. Um, you can't just let them eat grass though, and you can't just try to get by cheap and feed them you know, straight grain. They do have high nutritional requirements in order to produce eggs that have good nutrition for you. Okay, so some things to think about before you get your chickens. Um, you may want to check your local ordinances. They may have um, number restrictions and how many laying eggs, laying hens you can have, as well as whether or not roosters are permitted. And if you have roosters, the neighbors will know because they crow, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, and then you will, you'll have to get a house there if you go somewhere. You can't just leave them. You'll, they will need to be cared for on a regular basis. Although they're, they're not too difficult, you can set them up so they'll be fine while, if you're gone for the weekend, for example. Water must be available. Water is almost more critical than feed. They do need to have um, water available at all times. If you don't have a way to put some sort of heated waterer or a water heating um, unit underneath your heater. Uh, there's like a, there's a heater unit you can put underneath a watering um, unit. You're going to have to dump out that frozen ice and put in new water every day or just bring them out uh, fresh water. And your good quality feed that you buy at the retail level is not cheap. A mix for layers is usually around $15 for 50 pounds. If you, um, if you have access to a small feed mill, there is a way for people to use local grains and then add a special nutrient mix that is designed for creating feed for um, laying hens. And that's a nice way to use your local grains, but that have also been augmented with sufficient protein and vitamins for your laying hens. One of the most critical things, as I said already, is the need to be protected from predators. And the predators may be as close by as your own dogs. Um, the fencing must be sufficient for all kinds of predators and some things you, you might not even be aware of that could take them out like um, birds of prey, for example, and especially when they're little, they cannot fend for themselves. They do need housing and chickens are pretty messy and stinky. That housing will need to be cleaned on a regular basis. I think we've all seen um, some really, really cute chicken houses, but that's really not big enough if you want them to run around and be outside. So um, 
They'll have to have an outside fence around that. Today we're going to talk about basics for a small backyard flock and chicken behavior, chicken health. Um, so I, I want you to be sure to ask questions because there are a lot of basics. And I do highly recommend that you get some sort of a book. Either that or find a really good website source, but I do recommend like the story guides, S-T-O-R-E-Y. They have a guide to raising poultry, raising sheep the modern way it used to be my Bible when I raised sheep. They will tell you what you need to be doing at each stage for your animals. For when you get those cute baby chicks from that feed store, they have warmth requirements that are fairly high, they go down with time, but for the first four weeks, they are typically in a brooder or some situation with a heat lamp. And then the different rations, they need starter rations for six weeks at least that are high protein. Um, and while they tend to be pretty healthy, I really have lost very few chickens to disease problems over the years. You do need to observe them, uh, be a careful observer and manager of your livestock. And that's really the key to raising livestock, I feel, is to just look at them and make sure they're looking healthy and not having problems. Um, so you will need fencing uh, if you want your, your hens to lay all year round, which I feel strongly about because otherwise you're wasting money when you could be having eggs from your hens all year round, and it's not that hard to figure that out. Um, so some sort of way to have um, auxiliary light when we don't have our long days. Protection from predators, we'll look at some different methods. And then I just want you to think a little bit about the economics of backyard egg production. I'm an egg economist, uh, applied egg economist uh, by trade. I love to do the story problems and figure out how much it costs me to do some of my little farming experiments as well as big farming experience, experiments. Okay, chickens are fun. Um, they can be good pets if you socialize them to you. I love to raise my, my chicks so that they come running up to me to get their scraps from the kitchen. They're fun. Um, you have to habituate them to you and the noise that you make in your, as you put your hands in and out to change their feed. Um, you know, just get them used to you. And it's, it's kind of nice if they allow you to pick them up and aren't really fearful but they are social creatures. Having just one is not their preferred mode. They need, they would like to have, they would like to be a little flock. Um, if you decide to have roosters, just know that roosters, oh, they can be really rough on the hens and they also waste a lot of energy fighting among themselves if you have too many. Um, I did try putting some little protective jackets on my hens when I had a particularly rough rooster that was always um, rubbing their backs raw, um, but they, the hens really did not like those. I thought, I think it made the problem worse. So they looked like invaders, so everybody was attacking them. So um, yeah, there is a pecking order. That's what makes it a little bit tough when you combine um, new ones into a, an existing unit. And even when you buy several different kinds, it seems like birds of a feather flock together. I'm not sure if that's true, but it sure seems like it. Definitely, if there's a size difference, um, you'll have some pecking order. So how do you introduce babies when you're bringing in um, new chicks? You can try see, sneaking them in at night. Um, what I usually do is I have a pin within a pin. So I have my, right now I just put my four week old chicks outside in the hen house. Chickens are dirty and smelly and there is this film of very fine dust that will be all over your house if you've got baby chicks in it. As they're molting off that, those very fine feathers, you will have to dust all the time and of course they're a little bit stinky. So I have my four week old um, chickens outside in a water trough with a really nice um, wood framed wire cover over it and a heat lamp. And I'm really happy to have them out there. They're happy too. Okay, so it is really fun to watch your chickens. 
foraging is a big part of their daily work. They look for food, they peck and scratch. Right now, I feel like my four week old um, hens are, are kind of bored. And so I try to put little toys in their water trough. They love to play keep away with blades of grass and um, they just always want to be pecking at something. So I think it's a good exercise and it's um, actually pretty good entertainment. Um, yeah, but they, they, they need some activity. They're, they're meant to be doing this. That's their nat natural instinct. So you may have bad behavior. When we have like a lot of snow and they're kind of stuck in the hen house, that's when I, I see some of this pecking at each other, kind of bad behavior. Okay, so some other natural behavior of chickens is this dust baiting. The one on the left is they do this, they make a little hole in the ground and they they dust themselves. That's how they clean themselves to keep away, they keep the mites out. Um, they also oil their feathers. There's something called a uropegial gland at the base of their tail. See how fun, how much biology you can learn and uh, by having your own chickens. Anyway, it's very interesting. It helps keep their, their feathers waterproof and clean and helps keep them warm with the insulative. Um, they also do a lot of cleaning with their beaks. They remove mites with their beak. Um, one thing uh, that is can be a problem, and it is another natural instinct, is uh, broody hens. Some people like to have a broody hen that will sit on the eggs and hatch out new chicks, but it is a natural instinct. And if you have hens that are broody, they are not laying eggs for you. They're just sitting in the nest box, and often they get very territorial um, up on their eggs, and they, they just, their natural instinct is telling them to keep those eggs warm, do not get off the nest, and they limit their, their eating and their drinking and to just bare necessity and run back to those eggs. Um, some breeds are much more broody than others. The little banties, they tend to be broody, which is one reason some people keep them, is just for that purpose. Um, but of course, you're not going to have, you're not gonna be raising any baby chicks if you don't also have a rooster. And I live in town and I no longer have a rooster, so um, I don't want my hens to be broody. Something called prolactin is responsible for this behavior. And um, there is a, a fix. It takes a while sometimes, but you have to get their but to cool off to change that harm hormone. So I have a special wire cage that has a suspended wire floor. It's a, just a couple inches off the ground. Um, sometimes it's good to even put that on the block so there's more breeze under the cage. And then you just have to keep putting food and water in that cage. And um, it takes sometimes three to five days. They, they are not very happy, but you need that hormone to switch off to get them back into their regular egg laying behavior. Roosting is another behavior that chickens do. Um, they use the perches at night to sleep and that's the time to mess with them in case you don't know because they're they're very you know, they're sleepy and you can go in there when it's dark and if you need to look at one or grab it uh, or change new ones in and out that's the time to do it. I just learned something interesting lately um, if you have nest boxes mounted on the wall, which we do, and our roost, the highest one was at the same level as the nest boxes, and then there were two lower than that. But if you put perches higher than the level of the nest box, and we just now added two new ones, they prefer to be higher up. They feel safer to be perched higher up. It's like being in a tree for them. Um, they learn to use these when they're young, and that way you keep your nest box says clean. They might just go in there and sleep and then they're full of poop. So um, that's a challenge. If you have very heavy strains of breed, breeds of chicken, they'll be less likely to use the perches. They may wanna use straw bales and then they will get them very poopy and you waste your straw bales. But um, if you've got kind of stair-stepping methods of you know several perches, they, they'll go up them and they're pretty good at flying up them, even the heavier ones. 
And my sister likes to raise a lot of hands. She got addicted to this. So she usually has this about 30 to 50 hens. And she just has a lot of different branches that are placed about the big cage, kind of put from corner to corner, wherever. And that, that gives them chickens. They're quite happy to, to go up on those different branches and perch that way. Okay, this hen looks really bad. It's not always that bad, but it is um, a natural process called molting. They don't always molt, but um, it is prompted by declining day length, and that is typically in the fall, of course, and they will lose their flight feathers. And it does affect their laying, and they will be less interested in food, which is just why it affects their laying. So um, it is a natural process and it doesn't always occur, but it is one reason to kind of keep your chickens, your hens young. The older they are, it seems the more problematic this is. So um, a lot of people will switch out their flocks and not keep them more than two or three years before they get new hens. A serious problem of egg production is that sometimes they will start eating their own eggs, which is called egg cannibalism. Um, there, you may have seen these wooden nest eggs or white ceramic nest eggs. The reason uh, that, that those exist is you use them as decoys. Um, it helps the chickens know that that's where they should be laying their eggs. You want them to use a nest box. You don't want them just laying them anywhere. Um, and because of this problem of them sometimes eating an egg, if it cracks, if there's too many in there, they'll start pecking at, at the yolk and realize, oh, these are tasty. And then you'll get some that just start cracking and eating all the eggs. And you really have to get rid of them. Um, once they get that habit, it's really hard to cure it. That's why you might see some really fancy nest boxes that allow the eggs to roll out. So after they're laid, they roll out. Um, if you have that problem and you think you know which one it is, isolate it and then cull it. Okay, so um, throughout this presentation, I have YouTube links that will give you a lot more information. I know there are a lot of people on this presentation today and so I'm not going to go look at any of those and they're here for you to go look at and they should be in your handout as well because I do want to stop and um, ask to see what kind of questions we have and please um, write your questions down. Oh, this is a cue. Um, let's see. We Looks do like have we a few have... questions, Kate. Uh, yeah, I see that. Do you want me to just to read them or do you want to read them? I'll read them and then you can just take your okay. time answering them. Okay, great. So uh, Daphne asked, does it matter if the perch is round or flat for roosting at night? You know, I have seen them be just fine with either one, like a small one by two or a two by two or two by four even. Um, they'll work, they'll do that as well as a round one. I think the more, it's a little more natural for them to have a round one, like a branch. Uh, but they'll do, they'll do fine with either one. Just needs to be sturdy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Laura asks, um, so you recommend suppl supplemental lighting in the winter. What is your preferred strategy? Okay, my preferred strategy is, I think I might talk about this a little bit later, but this is fine, is we get a, an appliance timer and we, uh, we have to adjust it as the year goes by because initially you may be just needing to add extra light at the beginning of the day so your light might go on at one o'clock in the morning and turn off at 6 a.m and then they're getting that much more hours you want to have actually about 17 hours of light ideally to keep them laying throughout the winter so you may need to just keep adjusting your appliance timer a little bit and I have read people's thoughts about whether adding daylight to the beginning of the day versus the end of the day, which way is better. I don't think it really matters as long as you have a 17 hour day length period. So that's the ideal. And uh, you know, you're gonna, you can, you can, you can, you um, can be not quite that strict if you want to save some money, you figure, well, 
let's turn the light off that's um, <clears throat> costing us electricity. We're getting 15 hours of daylight now, so that should be good enough. Um, but the, you want to aim for like 17. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Daphne about whether or not hens actually need a break from laying. <clears throat> well, I think that in nature, if you want to keep your hens a long time, they would no doubt um, have longer lives if you did let them have a break. I would imagine that's a good assumption to make. <clears throat> um, however, if you're just trying to be economical, uh, you may want to just keep your hands for three years and keep a light on in the winter and have good egg production for two or three years <clears throat> and then change them out. Um, that's what I do. But if you, if you're, they're more like pets to you and you want them to be, to be as gentle on them as possible, you could just have them lay when they feel like it. <laughs> They'd probably <laughs> uh, be less hard on them. That's a good question. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Pam. She's wondering where you got your information on the nutritional information on eggs for free range versus not. She said she's been looking for a good resource. Uh, that is a good question because if you go online, there's a lot of different answers. Oh, it looks like uh, Mackenzie has a good... Mackenzie, did you want to jump in there? No, sorry. I was just moving the question out of here. Oh, okay. Yeah, no problem. So um, what I do when I'm trying to find extension resources is I type my question and then I type plus edu. So the plus sign above the equals, I just put plus edu. And that usually brings up some university resource. So when I did that, I did come, I did get a, a, an actual scientific study that said, of course, it really depends. We can't say that in general, but um, you know, they'll say one study cited did with, you know, comparing this type with this situation with that controlled situation. Um, so that's where I came up with the information from the slide was from a specific scientific study. So um, good question. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Kelly says, my nine-year-old wants to know if different breeds of hens make different colored yolks. Oh, well, that is a great question too. We do have different colored outside shells and that's really fun from dark brown to green and blue, um, light brown and white. But the eggs yolks tend to be pretty consistent um, from breed to breed. What really changes the color of the yolk is the amount of beta carotene. That orange, that, that's what makes the orange in carrots. And so if they're getting a lot of greens, they will have a more beta carotene rich eggs. And that is one of the fun things like that slide that showed a darker orange yolk. So it's more diet dependent than breed dependent. Okay, great. So I think I'll just do two more questions and we have a bunch about nutrition, but I think that that might be covered in your presentation. So we'll loop back around those. So a couple more questions. Judith says, please say more about how to successfully integrate new chicks into a two-year-old flock. Um, She's yeah. also would be really interested in seeing plans for a very nimble mobile chicken coop so that they could rotate their chickens around the garden. Okay, so yeah, I have introduced new chicks uh, into an existing flock a number of times. And so first of all, I have them in the house in a smaller box and with a, because the first few days, they need about 91 to 93 degrees temperature for them. This, often have a brooder, the bigger operations will have a brooder that provides that. I just use a heat lamp and then um, every like days four to seven, it's 90 to 93, day eight to 14 is 85 to 89. Mine are four weeks old now and so they can, uh, they can live in a 70 degree temperature situation and I could not wait to put them outside because um, the dust and smell they were um, and I, so I put them outside in my chicken house with a heat lamp over them, um, tacked up with not only a cord, but a 
a nail as well. So a backup way to make sure that that light does not fall and cause a fire. And then a, a big water trough cage. So at four weeks, they're out there with the others and the others are getting used to them, but they can't interact. And in another few weeks, I will then just have them be fenced off within the hen house, probably, and just starting to see if, if I can introduce them um, into the pen, them into the being all together. But usually for a while, I'll have it fenced off so they have their side and the hens, my pre existing hens, have their own side. And um, it helps to be next to each other and just start to get used to them. They can look at them. And so, like, if you had to see through, fence like a little panel of a cyclone fencing or something like that that's a wire so they can see each other but not um hurt you know so the big ones won't hurt the little ones or run after them and they'll they'll do that a little bit at first so you're going to have to monitor it i figure by the time they're eight weeks old they'll be big enough and nimble enough that um they'll be okay but i'll start introducing them probably in about two or three weeks They'll be too big for their water trough. So yeah, fencing off your existing situation so they have their own, but um, just so they get used to their sounds and sights and be protected for a while. Oh, let's see. And the other question was, the same person had two questions. Oh, yes. The, her, the second part of hers was where to look for like a mobile chicken coop that would be garden sized. Plans for a mobile chicken coop. That oh would be yeah. Okay. So um, I I've written a bulletin that's about raising um, organic broilers. So um, I can provide that if you Google for it's a it's a U of I extension publication on um, raising organic broilers. You should be able to find that. If not, you can also just email me directly. I'd be happy to send that out. And it does have a plan uh, for a mobile uh, chicken tractor um, and it was based on the whole um, bulletin was based on some work I did with that uh, Washington State University where the Puyallup Research and Extension Center used chicken tractors to fertilize their organic vegetables. Oh great so Mackenzie will look for that during the webinar and put that link in the chat so that's great thank you. Okay, last question before we move on, because this deals with what you just talked about. Will a broody hen attack you outright? And how do you know if a hen is normal, but a little more territorial, or whether or not they're broody? Oh, those are good questions. Yeah, definitely. They, uh, they, they are often, <laughs> often when they're on the nest, they are a little protective and they don't want you grabbing the egg. It's nice to have friendly hens that you don't have to like use a broom handle or something to hold their neck away from your hand as you try to get the egg out from underneath. Um, but uh, so there's normal territorial behavior and it, that's why it's nice to have your hens be friendly. And then there's the broody behavior where they're, they're gonna fuss and fuss and fuss because they do not wanna get off the nest. They, their nature is telling them to sit on those eggs um, and they'll just keep running back. So, I mean, you'll just have to watch that. If, they, if they're just trying to have their egg and they want some privacy, they might be a little territorial and pick at you, but they're not gonna be in there every time you go look at them. A broody hen is amazing at how very dedicated they are to that sitting on those eggs. So if they're still sitting there an hour later, they're probably getting broody. Um, and yeah, they can be they can be a little bit uh, hard on you. You might have to wear a pair of leather, leather gloves or put some sort of a little barrier. Sometimes I just even have my little feed pan that I put between me and, and the chicken as I try to reach the egg. But um, if your hens are, are friendly and raised to be used to you, they, they don't tend to be so bad at that. Great. Thank you for answering those questions. Let's go through your next section and see if that answers some of the health questions that we've received. Well, actually, the questions have been really, really good because I, I think I talk, I don't talk as much about feed as I, as I do in presentations that are targeted toward that. Um, I try to make this more general 
So um, there's some common health problems that a good manager of your backyard flock needs to be on the lookout for. Again, just observation, observation um, is, is key. Diarrhea with their blood, that could be coccidiosis, which is a, a disease that it, part of the bacteria is in your soils to begin with. So they, they pick that up from soils. My sheep used to get that. Um, cannibalism is another reason you might see blood because they're being pecked at. Um, but they can also have a very green pasture that can cause diarrhea. And one more note on that grass, um, chickens that are, are ranging on grass, they do not get much nutrition from the grass itself and they can't survive on grass alone. They're eating bugs, they're eating seeds, and they still need to have good quality feed. So that's kind of a, a funny thing that people think you can feed chickens just grass, but you can't. Um, the example in this picture is um, a possible bumblefoot or swollen hawk. So you can see how that, instead of having those three fingers coming together there, um, you've got a, a ball there. It's a swollen part of their foot. And um, that I believe you can treat with antibacteria, with um, antibiotics that is. And it used to be that you could just put antibiotics in their water if you needed to. Um, I know people frown upon that now, so um, it may be a better way to treat for bumblefoot. I should have looked that up, but um, you do need to watch their feet a little bit and make sure they look healthy. And, you know, uh, your backyard chickens will probably be very healthy because you won't have a lot of them. You'll keep them relatively clean. They'll have good access to fresh air and water and feed, and so you do tend to get very few health problems in backyard flocks. Um, you may see some weird central nervous system problems. Um, if they're acting strangely, uh, it's often, it can just be age if it's just one hen. Um, I, myself, I've never seen this, but um, in when I raise sheep, you can get uh, central nervous system problems from a, a nutrition deficiency, like vitamin A or selenium deficiency that will um, cause them to jerk around, act strangely, and then not be able to get up again. Okay, so um, I guess I'd just keep saying, keep an eye on your flock, know when they look healthy and know when they don't. This one looks quite unhealthy. And it's hard to know if, uh, if you've got a flock, which most of us do, to know that they're not eating or drinking, if, if it's just one sick animal. So um, look at their feathers, if they're dull, or if there's a color change in their feathers or in their, in their uh, comb or their wattle, that's all another indication. Look for stained feathers around the vent, which is their anus, their, or on their shoulders or eyes, because they typically wipe their nasal just discharge on their shoulders. Um, again, watch for swelling, redness, or feather loss around the eyes. You see this one? has lost feathers around its eyes. Um, also crusty material in the nostrils right here. You can see that this, this hen is obviously sick. And um, again, watch for lameness. Here's an even sicker bird, a fluffed or huddled posture. Um, sometimes they can get an egg actually stuck. Um, that's not very common, but that's one I have experienced a couple times. Um, they might look real hunchy like that. Uh, they, in a, again, it's hard to know uh, if they're having a poor appetite, but if you go, especially if you go out with um, treats and they don't come running up for them, um, you, you, you can tell when one of them is not eating well. If you hear them breathing strangely, abnormal, labored, or noisy, that's another sign. If they're just thin, it's nice if you can pick up your hands and see that they're heavy. And, and see that they're laying. You can tell if they're laying or if they're not. If you pick them up and see what the width of their, where their egg comes out of, that should be wide and not narrow, their, their vent there. Um, just look at their, their beaks and their faces and um, make sure they look healthy. It's kind of hard to see what's going on in their body because they're covered with feathers, but um, if you notice something on their legs, for example, that can be bad. Um, bleeding, obviously, and then if they are just acting strangely. Okay, so I realized that given our pandemic, 
I needed to talk a little bit more about avian influenza. One reason that we, we emphasized in the extension office, uh, this looking at your flocks and making sure they're healthy is um, this is an infectious viral disease of birds that doesn't typically infect people, but it has and it can. And that's why the USDA um, and other government agencies put out a lot of information and have hotlines and such to help with that. Avian influenza occurs naturally among wild aquatic birds around the world, so ducks and geese. And if those wild birds are infected and somehow have contact with your own poultry, then your own poultry can get sick. Um, so several cases of highly pathogen genetic, highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI, H5 have been confirmed in the Pacific Central and December flyways since December of 2015. Most cases are in domestic flocks worldwide. And so we have a CDC site that gives you more information about that. So these are the signs of avian influenza in your chickens, coughing, sneezing, respiratory distress, de decreased egg production, swelling of the head, comb, and waddles, sudden death. And if you don't know what's wrong, uh, you know, if you see something that even looks remotely like that, please do call the ISDA, Idaho State Department of Ag State Veterinarian's Office. You should be able to find that. Or USDA APHIS, which is, uh, I think it's the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, uh, because they may want you to send that animal in. And I know that we've had to test our, our or different waterfowl and chickens even before they could come to the fair because there have been cases in Idaho, in Canyon County in particular. So it is good to also report any sick or dead wild birds to the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Yeah, okay, I thought I had a, a bullet on this. There was a backyard chicken flock that had to be isolated and then um, depopulated as they politely say and they also found some in three domestic falcons that had interacted with, somehow got it from wildlife. So um, we, have, we have to worry about that in addition to everything else these days. Uh, it rarely if infects humans, but it can be deadly if it does. So this sounded very familiar. Infected birds shed avian influenza virus in their saliva, mucus, and feces. Human infections occur when enough virus gets into a person's eyes, nose, or mouth, or is inhaled. It can occur when virus is in the air in the form of droplets or dust, when it is breathed in, or when a person touches a contaminated surface then touches their mouth, eyes, or nose. The illness can be severe, even fatal, but it is not typically spread from person to person. So the only reason I have to have a good dust mask when the pandemic um, occurred was because I always use one when I clean my chicken house. There are a lot of bad germs in chicken dust and dander there. Um, I just don't clean a chicken house without somehow protecting your, your, yourself from breathing anything in. Um, those won't typically Usually what's there is not going to kill you, but it can give you actually a sinus infection. I have gotten too many of them from cleaning the chicken house, so I never clean the chicken house without wearing a mask. Okay, and there is a lot of information on this, the poultry site, quick disease guide. This is a very good guide if, you have, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with your poultry. I don't mean to scare you. I've had very little disease incidents, especially if you're taking care of them in a small situation but um, those are the things you want to watch for. Should we take a few more questions? Yeah, this, that would be great. Uh, we have a question from Rachel about worming. What do they need to do? I uh, have to admit I don't worm my chickens. I haven't had pressure from that um, and interestingly I raised sheep for decades and um, I would test their, I would do tests of their, of the manure to see if we had, um, you know, to do fecal counts and you could do that to find out um, because we live near the vets, the vet, uh, the vet, uh, 
college in Pullman, Washington, those students would come out and do it as an exercise for us for free. But um, I had very little uh, worm pressure, even in my sheep flock, which was actually fairly wet ground because we have our hot, dry summers. So, um, you know, trying to, I think sanitation, not letting your, your chicken housing get too dirty, getting, keeping them with nice, clean water and feed containers. I just have not bothered to worry about worms in my, my hands. I just do worry about sanitation because it's good for everything. So I, I think that with a small backyard flock, you could probably get away without worrying about worms. I could be wrong, but that's been my experience. And, and you know, you've got your books that I would, I would highly recommend that you do find a guide to raising poultry. So you have a, some sort of a good guide when you have questions like that. Great, thank you, Kate. We have another question, and this one is about vaccines. Do we need to administer a Merck vaccine in our area of North Idaho? And if yes, when do you need to give a vaccine? Well, I buy my chicks day old, typically. So they have already been vaccinated. Uh, when you get them from a, uh, any kind of a hatchery, they will have had the proper vaccinations. But if you're raising them yourself, is that what you're talking about, maybe? Yes, if they didn't already come, if you're hatching your own birds. If you're hatching your own birds, um, you know, that's again, something that a backyard flock, I have not worried about myself. I think you could probably contact a veterinarian and have that done. But uh, my sister, who's a veterinarian, who has a lot of poultry herself and raises them, I don't think she's ever vaccinated them either. So, you know, again, good sanitation, nice, clean living for your chickens is probably the, the most important strategy to having a healthy flock. So I think some of these things are probably not necessary in a small backyard flock. And... Um, it's also the cost versus the benefit is very probably unlikely that they will have any problem. And if they did, you know, you've lost a very small investment. You've not lost hundreds of dollars. You might've lost, you know, $30 or something, so. Great, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead into your next section of your presentation. I think it'll answer some of the remaining questions. Okay, so one of the most important things um, beyond sanitation and access to water and all that is feed. The starter feed for chicks, <clears throat> actually I have another source that I was just reading right now and I'm going, to, I'm going to say something different than what is written. Your starter ration should be 20% protein. And then after that, your chick ration can be 18%. So, um, you could use a starter feed for chicks that's 18% protein for four to five months. But even better than, than that is if you use your 20% um, protein starter and then you have your grower. So I'm, I'm gonna change that slide. Uh, the starter ration for the first six weeks should be at least 20%. Then switch to your grower ration, which is 17 to 18% for the next four to five months, and then you need to be switched them to a, a feed that is formulated for laying hens that has a, a different, it has more calcium, for example. But uh, the better you feed them, the faster they'll grow, the healthier they'll be. Super critical to use good feed. Um, so yeah, your laying hens need 3% calcium in your feed. And one danger that you can do, and I have done this, is to feed them too many leftovers and things out of the garden. They may prefer that because, you know, they love squash and zucchini and cucumbers and all kinds of tasty things like that, but you can imagine they're filling up on something that doesn't have the right formulation. Uh, so a couple things about feeding them kitchen leftovers or garden leftovers. I feed mine a lot of garden leftovers. Don't just keep your kitchen leftovers building up in your kitchen day after day in the warm summer months. Feed them right away, feed them the same day. So if you've got leftovers from dinner, um, 
don't let those hang around for days because you can get toxins building up in the spoiled food and you don't want to make them sick. Uh, they do need to eat poultry feed that is designed for them and don't dilute their ration with too much other material. They love to eat things like leftover spaghetti and Cheerios and it's so much fun to feed them, but <laughs> do remember they need to eat their other food as well. I do like the hanging feeders on the right and that's what I use for my chickens. That way I can just hang it from the roost and there's less spillage. The only problem that comes in is I know I have a skunk that comes in and tips it, tips it out, puts it on the floor and eats it. Um, another thing that people don't realize, and it was funny because WSU Puyallup, they did not realize this either when they started their experiment with raising broilers, that you have to give them grit for proper digestion and good egg production. They need grit, which is kind of like small pieces of gravel, and you have different sizes. As they get older, you give them a little. The smaller one, the chick stick, as, uh, looks like those are actually sticks of some kind, but they do need this in order to digest their food. I'm not an expert on this topic, and so I can't really explain the biology, but it is a fun thing to go, go figure that out. And I do have a grit station that's like this, where I put oyster shell in one side for extra calcium and then poultry grit in the other. Oh, okay. I did actually an entire present, uh, an entire extension class on how to feed your laying hens because it is critical, it's important, and here is a Pacific Northwest Extension publication you can find on the U of I Extension website. Um, anyway, how to feed your laying hens is fairly new and a really excellent, excellent resource. Um, watering. Watering is tricky because you want to keep it clean and you want them to have good access to water and um, when in the wintertime it can freeze. So here are, uh, here, these are all from Premier One Supplies. There are other places as well. I, um, I've had a lot of good luck with that company and I bought a lot of very reasonable supplies um, for my poultry from them as well as for my sheep. So um, you can use mason jars with a little base. You can get those locally. I know lots of places that allows you to wash them out really well, get a couple so you can switch them out. Um, you can get a heated poultry waterer or you can use those old galvanized type things that have a galvanized heater that goes underneath. You'd recognize it if I showed you a picture, but um, a hanging one again is nice to keep the dirt out. Okay, this is Darling. I just found this recently. Um, housing. Small flocks allow three square feet per bird. One of the reasons home flocks are so healthy is because you get, they do get a lot more space than is required legally. You need to add some more room for your other structures, your feeder, your water, your nest boxes. Um, you need to provide a roost of some kind. They really want that. Curtains for nest boxes are a really nice addition because they discourage them from going in there to just sleep or poop. So the curtains, they will, they will seek out a back corner to lay their eggs and hopefully go perch and poop and everything else elsewhere. And why not have them be darling like this? Um, you can buy setups like this, a nesting box with a roll out egg holder. So as soon as they're laid, they roll out and the, they can't get to them and a curtain, <laughs> nestomatic. Uh, manure control, another concern here. I know I see that I need to move rapidly. Deep litter is probably the best choice. You just keep adding litter as it gets dirty in the winter time. You just keep adding more shavings or more, more straw so they have a clean surface. Uh, the birds enjoy scratching around in it and the moisture gets absorbed and you're going to have a healthy foot pad for the bird. Very important in the winter when they're confined inside. Um, and then you clean it, out, clean it out completely when it's too wet or soiled. Add it to your compost pile. Okay, I'm going to quickly go through this, but you do need to um, clean your eggs and store them at 55 degrees or refrigerate them wash with a food grade disinfectant. Um, we talked about lighting al already. This, this resource is 14 to 16 hours. I, had, I, I usually go up to 17 because I really push my hands. Um, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. in the appliance timer works well, but they're not going to produce all throughout the year without supplemental light. That supplemental light just can be very minimal if you 
can just read the newspaper with it, that's enough. Okay, so I'm going to keep moving and just talk a little bit more about protection from predators. Um, you may have to close your chicken house at night. Predators often are um, night creatures, so there's automatic ways to have your chicken house door, have a guillotine door that comes down at, at night and goes up in the morning. It's kind of fun what people have done with their chicken housing. This has a good uh, tight fence and the strong base, rocks around the base, um, so things can't scratch and get in. And it looks like you can see that it has a chicken netting up over the top too, to keep out flying insects or things like raccoons can climb vertically up the, up the outside of that pin and then just drop in. Um, it needs to be tied to the ground or possibly even extend underground and there's things that will climb up in the trees and then drop down into your into your fencing as well. You need overhead protection if your pin is very large so that birds can fly in. <clears throat> um, there's so many great designs. This is a really fun video with a woman and her daughter uh, building a chicken house. A lot of good family type activities. Um, in my case, I have lost chickens to my own dogs more than anything else. They will naturally chase or eat them. But if you've got day-old chicks and you're habituating your dogs, you show that to them and you get them used to them, that's a good way to do that. Our Border Collie interacts with them from day one. She loves them, she protects them. Um, I also have had Pyrenees that are really good at keeping coyotes away. I've also had Pyrenees that have eaten them. Um, you can train your dogs to not go after your hens. Um, I've had some really tough ones where you really, really have to punish them for chasing your chickens until they quit doing it. So that's not very fun. But um, guardian dogs can be excellent for protecting poultry. Sometimes when they're young, they will chase and eat one or two. Again, um, you've got to catch them in the act and, and punish them. And um, that's hard to do. So it, it, it can be a tough issue. All right, so after having many tough issues, I fell in love with using electric poultry fencing. It's got a high initial cost, but it keeps the chickens in and it discourages all kinds of predators. It's easy to move. So when the grass or the ground is getting beat up from the chickens, you can keep moving it. It lasts a really long time. You can have a nice big area, or like when I raise broilers in particular, I need to just keep moving it around at my pasture so that the chickens are fertilizing it, but not destroying the grass. So um, there's a link to an article about Electronet. Here is a picture and you can keep your house in the same position and just keep moving that poultry netting um, to take up different areas and allow them to keep having nice clean um, areas to run in that they're fertilizing and without destroying them. You may want to look at plastic chicken wire. It's got a nice different structure than wire. It works better for some practices than others. Another picture of using Electronet with a mobile chicken house. Um, it's very easy to do. You just tie it up to a fence post. I do it by myself all the time. And then you just kind of walk backward and drop off one, one post at a time. You're just holding all the posts there. It looks awkward, but it's quite easy. Um, and you will need a fence charger. If you're going to do that, you can get a solar type one um, or one that you trade out and energize every few days. Um, it's easy enough to prop it up. There's an energizer. Again, I guess I'm advertising for Premier One, but there are other sources online. This is a company in Iowa that's been uh, very reliable. Lots and lots of resources. Backyard Poultry Magazine is a nice one for this topic in particular. I would recommend that. Um, <clears throat> our extension resources are fantastic. There are a lot on backyard poultry product production. As, as I said, just type plus edu or you can go to extension.org as you see in this slide and find so many good resources. Another resource is SARE, which we mentioned at the beginning that supports this programming. USDA SARE is a sustainable ag research and education and they have a huge library learning center from that link. 
and there's one article. Uh, finally, a colleague of mine who's an ag economist and really loves poultry production. She has an excellent publication on determining cost and returns for a 15 hen flock. And of course, the sad news is once you've covered all of your costs of production, you it was about a $6 per dozen break even price. Okay, we have time for a little bit more questions. Thank you, Kate. I'm just gonna remind everyone that you do have your slides. And so those that information and those links are available there. And we've also been putting some links into the chat so you can grab those and be able to have those resources. Uh, Kate, we have a, a question about how and where do urban owners get rid of chickens if needed for age and behavior? <laughs> that is a really good question that I am not sure I know the answer to. Uh, <clears throat> dead chickens, you can take them to the landfill where I live. Um, uh, just You can put them in your trash bagged up. Um, yeah, I don't really like to have to euthanize my animals for any purpose. But probably the, the best way to do that, if you have to, is to, um, to confine them. They have like a cone that's like a traffic cone. But if you don't have a way to do that, you could just use um, something like I've used an empty kitty litter container that has a big opening and stuffed it in and so that their head goes out the bottom so that they're not flailing. And then the most humane thing is to just um, cut the jugular really with, with a sharp knife and um, then if they're not flapping, you can catch the blood in another bucket. So it's not a very pleasant method, but um, that's the one I know. Yeah, thank you. I have seen also on some uh, Facebook groups related to backyard poultry that sometimes there's community members that will take birds that are no longer producing eggs for more of a pet enjoyment uh, to have in their backyard. So that might be another option. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, if you know somebody that will take them and possibly want to use them themselves or to eat them, um, it's a, quite a bit of work to butcher a chicken and turn it into food, but um, we do that ourselves, actually. It just seems like the most humane and, um, you know, kind of practical thing to do when they are no longer producing or if they're, they're eating. Um, so that's a topic for another webinar is how to do that. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I think the last question that we're going to take uh, today is with electric fencing, how do you prevent from overhead predators like hawks and eagles? Well, you don't, um, except for you could, now that I said that, by making the shape like long instead of wide. So they won't, they don't like to land if they don't feel like they can land and then take off again so they don't have like a runway so if you made it um maybe a, a unusual shape like like um instead of being round that you made it kind of a semicircle and then another semicircle you know so it's like a a thick c or something like that or maybe that it had had some kind of a another strange shape that made it harder for them to fly in I really haven't had problems with overhead predators except for in big fields. So um, I, I know other people have had problems with owls and such. So um, you can get an owl, like a fake owl, a decoy, and you can even get ones that they, their wings kind of flap. Something like that would be um, another way to discourage birds of prey. Okay, great, thank you. So we had a few other questions about nutrition specifics, and I'm glad that you shared that great publication that folks can check out and that will answer a lot of those nutrition questions. So thank you so much for your presentation, Kate, and we appreciate uh, everyone who has stayed on a little longer today. There were so many great questions, a lot of enthusiasm for this topic. So Kate, is there anything you would like to share before we move on to look at uh, what the upcoming webinars are? Well, again, I really have some favorite books. I like the small scale poultry flock very much. It's called The All-Natural Approach to Raising Chickens and Other Fowl for Home and Market Garden Growers. And I believe um, Mackenzie has shared that as well. It's by Harvey 
usery, U-S-S-E-R-Y. It's got more information on ducks and turkeys as well. So um, yeah, there's some web-based resources. Oh, thank you, there we are. Um, just do your research and, and have fun. Great, thank you, Kate. So these books and this link to this UC Davis Backyard Poultry website are available in your handout. And just a reminder that you're going to be able to find a recording of this webinar and the associated handouts on the Cultivating Success web website. All you have to do is click on this recorded webinar button and you will see that and the other webinars that we have recorded. We do have several upcoming webinars. So next week we have a webinar on local food system businesses and some of the resources and considerations in thinking about your local food system business when you're moving beyond our current COVID-19 situation. On Monday, May 11th, Kate is going to do a webinar on selling your products on Etsy. And then later in May, we have two webinars on the fundamentals of produce safety. And those are gonna be given by Stephanie Smith, who's the consumer produce safety educator with Washington State University. And then on Tuesday, June 2nd, I will be doing a follow-up webinar to this webinar called Taking Eggs to Market, Safe Egg Handling and Delivery. So you can reg register for any of those webinars right on the Cultivating Success website. We do have a really short post webinar evaluation that is going to launch in your browser when we conclude the webinar today. We would really appreciate your taking that, the time to complete that survey. And one of the questions that we do have is what other information do you need about backyard poultry? So that we can put some more resources up on our website with the recording of this webinar that will meet those needs. So you will also have this link in the handouts that I sent to you. And again, it's really helpful to get your feedback. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we look forward to having you on another Cultivating Success webinar in the future. Good luck with those backyard flocks.